Welcome to module two of the team training and customer service for dental offices. Again, trying to make sure that you know how to take action to create an amazing customer service experience in your dental practice versus an average experience, which is what most people are. That's the definition of average. Part two, we're talking about first impressions. In other words, when people come to your office, how do you wow them? Because you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And that's really what people are gonna judge you on. Most of your referrals from your client base come after a new patient's first visit. Did you know that? Statistically speaking, existing patients will tell someone about their experiences with you if they are asked, but new patients who are wowed will share that information immediately. That's where more than half of your customer uh, referrals come from is from brand new patients. So let's get into it. First, we talk about need to talk about something. The four levels of competence. There's to start with. You know, what do you know what you're doing? In other words, there is something called unconscious incompetence. This is where you don't know what you're doing, and you don't even know that you don't know what you're doing. Good example. I'm going to go dental right away on you. Is first year of dental school. First year of dental school or first year in the clinics, I guess I would say, you're with a patient and you are so bad at what you're doing that you don't even know how bad you are at what you're doing. Instructors are running ripshot over you, they have to because you just don't know what's going on. After a while, you start to realize that you don't know what you're doing. And that level is called conscious competence. And this is where you've got to think about what you're doing, but you're still not very good at it. But at least now you're aware of it. Next level is called conscious competence. And again, you follow the train of thought here. You know what you're doing, and you know that you know what you're doing. In other words, you're providing good work. A good dentist has been in practice for maybe five years at this point. He's doing good work, but he's got to focus on it every time. He's cutting a crown, and he's got to think about every little line angle, every little margin, every little thing he's going on there. And lastly, sort of the state of euphoria of customer service or any kind of, of work is unconscious competence. My best example of that is driving the car. I know you've had this experience. You got in your car at the end of a day of work, you drove home, you pull in the driveway or the garage and you don't remember the drive. Did you need to think about every time you had to turn on the turn signal or every time you had to stop at a red light? Or you, your brain just did it. You might have been thinking about something totally different. Plans for that night, where you're gonna go out for dinner that night with your wife, maybe some complicated case you've gotta sort through in your brain. You had something else completely occupying every waking minute and yet you got home completely safe and sound because you are an unconsciously competent of driving a car. But. Can you apply that to other things in your life? Can you become unconsciously competent at customer service, at providing dentistry in your, in your office? You probably can. Let's talk about how we're gonna help some of that to happen. Until you are competent, you fake it till you make it. That's as simple as it gets. You need to pretend that you know what you're doing, even if you don't, if you wanna convince people. So if you're a young dentist first out, or, or whatever, you know, if someone outside of dentistry is watching this video, whatever your role is, can you fake it so that other people believe in you? I'm gonna tell you a story about our favorite Mexican restaurant that just, I've told this story many times to many audiences, if you've heard it, bear with me, but it makes the point of, of fake it till you make it better than anything I could ever explain to you. This is not our favorite Mexican restaurant. It's a slide of a Mexican restaurant because I needed a placeholder. So my, my, uh, my wife and I, I think one of my kids who was a teenager at the time and a couple of my team members from my dental office all decided to go out for lunch one afternoon. It was the middle of a work day. It wasn't the whole group. It was just, hey, who wants to go to lunch? A couple people came. So we sit down. We're used to Caesar. This is not Caesar. It's a good picture of a guy that looks like Caesar, though. Caesar is always our waiter. I think he was the head waiter there for many years. I asked him once if he owned it, and he didn't, but he was always around. He managed the place. He was the head waiter, whatever. He'd always come over, first thing, you know, give us some menus, take our drink orders. It was easy. So we're expecting to see Caesar, like always. But instead, this little guy shows up. This is Caesar's son. Caesar's son has been op taking opportunity or taking advantage of free daycare at the Mexican restaurant since he was a year old. Since his kid could learn to walk around, Caesar's brought his little son to work every day. We've seen him around. He doesn't do anything, he's just around. Obviously mom's working somewhere else and dad can bring his kid to work because nobody seems to mind. Fine. Well, now that several years have gone by, on this particular visit, Caesar's kid is maybe four years old in that neighborhood, right? Walks around. And what happens? His son comes out with a pad of paper and a pencil behind his ear. And he comes right out to me and he looks at me, gets his pad of paper out, pulls the pencil from behind his ear. He puts his pencil to his paper and he looks at me. And I mean, he stares, just stares. I look at my wife and I say, what's he doing? 
goes, I think he wants your order. I'm like, he's four years old, he can't take an order. She goes, well, he's been around a lot. I'm like, yeah, I know, still staring. Now he points his pencil at me, nods his little head, looks at his paper, he's waiting to go. I'm like, you think maybe Caesar taught him to take drink orders or something? She goes, I don't know, we'll try him, all right. So, so I go, are you looking for drink orders? He goes, I said, all right, well, I'll, I'll take an iced tea. He writes down, iced tea. I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. He looks at my wife next, and he's waiting. She goes, all right, I'll have a glass of water. So this continues around the table. He's about three or four people in when suddenly Caesar's dad comes out, and he says, all right, here's your menu, so what do you guys want to drink? And I said, oh, I think your son already started that process. He's been taking our drink orders. He says, he can't take drink orders. He's four years old. And he flips around that scrap of paper, and it's nothing but scribble. Now that kid fooled six adults, six Adults with educations, several of us college educated. I am a doctor, my wife is a nurse. What the heck were we doing? You know what he did? He faked it until he made it. It was nothing short of embarrassing that we had given this kid our order, but an immediate light bulb went off in my head. You can be convincing enough that people will believe you know what you're doing. A four year old proved it to me and it was an amazing experience. Let's talk about dentistry for a second. Dentistry is expensive, is it not? Well, no, it's not. Neglect is expensive. We are the fix. We are not the problem. Agreed? It's not me that didn't brush their teeth. They didn't brush their teeth. So stop feeling guilty for that. Do our patients value our dentistry? Well, they don't value it because of clean margins, 20 micron gaps, or tertiary anatomy in your composites. They value it because of your friendly environment, your customer service, everything else that they experience, their experience in the place. Did the shot hurt? Were you running on time? Does your breath smell? You know, all that kind of stuff. More importantly, do we value our own dentistry? So do you feel that your work is A-plus work? If not, go to some courses. I'll tell you an experience I had. Maybe 12, 13 years ago now, I decided to join the AACD, the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. <clears throat> Excuse me. They are known as the harbinger of all things amazing in cosmetic dentistry. So I went to my, I joined the, the, the organization. I went to my first meeting, whatever city it was in, and I walked in there knowing very well that I was a good cosmetic dentist. I would have given myself a B plus, A minus at least. I knew there were some people who could do better work than me. I've seen publications and whatnot, thinking oh, I wish I could get to that level one day. But I'm a solid B plus, A minus student when it comes to that. I left that meeting thinking my work is barely passable. By the standards that were presented at that meeting anyway, they were barely passable. I had some work to do. Did I value my own dentistry? I did, I had a really high ego for my own dentistry before that. I was humbled, but more importantly, I did something about it, and I brought it up to what I feel now is pretty much A work, A minus maybe. I still know those people better than me, but you're hard pressed to find one nearby. National scale, you'll find people better than I do on cosmetic dentistry. I've, I've circled myself with fantastic laboratory technicians, great dental assistants, imp improvements in materials. I'm using materials I didn't even know existed before I went started going to AACD meetings. So do we value our own dentistry? I do, I hope your team does as well. If you have a staff member or a team member who goes somewhere else for the dentistry, there's a sure sign they don't value yours. How do I know that? I've got two families Separate families, separate dental offices, two families that come to me for their dental care when the mom works as an assistant in a different practice in my town. Do they value their doctor's dental care? No, and neither do their patients, clearly. Do your patients value dentistry? Well, they got in the car and drove there. Nobody forced them to come in, right? So if they got in the car and drove there, it means they made a choice, a decision to come to you, which means they must have some value on it. Now it's your job to improve it. How do we value our teeth? Well, I have a question for you. Is anybody who's here watching this, I love to pose this in a live audience, is anybody willing to give up a front tooth for a few dollars? What's your number? What is your number? Would you give me a front tooth for a hundred? Oh, I'll put the implant in, I'll do it for free. And I'll give you a hundred dollars. Deal? I'll give you a thousand dollars, no takers. If I offer $10,000 in a big group of 500 people that I'm talking to, I still get zero hands raised. Nobody wants to lose a front tooth, even if it's replaced with an implant. You start getting up to about a half a million, I'll get some volunteers. But it just doesn't get there, why? Because we have a very high value on our teeth. Do your patients? Not all of them, some end up looking like this. I call that dental Yahtzee, kind of shake them all up, throw them out there. Let's talk about morning meetings. How do we start our day with customer service in mind? 
they have to be purposeful. That what's the purpose of a morning meeting? We go through every chart with every name and talk about what we're doing that day, whether it's treatment or hygiene, anything factual about that treatment or hygiene we should know. Did he ignore something, went too long? Did, uh, you know, is this their, are we switching them over to three month sessions now because their perio is out of control? Did they graduate from three to six? Or anything clinical. We also talk about anything about the person that maybe I don't know about. Did, you know, their dog pass away? Did they get divorced or married or kid graduate school? Somebody might know something from the chart will pop up. It's a purposeful morning meeting so that we are connected on a customer service level to the people coming in that day. That takes my office half an hour. We have a lot of people, a lot of treatment rooms. It takes 30 minutes to go through every chart. And we barely finish on time. But I know something about every patient I'm gonna see that day, and that's important. What are the mechanics of it? I kinda just went through that. We're first gonna talk about the patients of the day. The doctor, you're always having a great day also, by the way. When you come to work in the morning, smiles on. I don't care what happened to you last night or this morning or overnight or what nightmares you had or who you had a fight with this morning or what you tripped over or what you stepped on that was sharp like a Lego block. Experience talking there. When you get to the office, you are having a great day. Right? We review the schedule in its entirety, like I just said. We always book out some emergency time, usually right at two o'clock in the afternoon because if we don't get an emergency, then we have a little bit longer lunch. Yay. Talk about what we can fill in there. Now we look at the charts for more opportunities to do more dental work. Someone says, I've got so-and-so in hygiene at, at uh, 10 o'clock this morning, and last time we diagnosed they needed a crown. Well, you've got an opening at 11 o'clock. Let's see if we can't transition them right into your 11 o'clock opening to get that crown done. Things like that, so it's not a surprise at the end of the day or at the end of their appointment. And the hygienist can start working on that right at the beginning of the session, not wait till the last minute. Then we talk about patient news again. Did somebody graduate, get married, divorced, or whatever the case may be? So we can kind of connect on an interpersonal basis. Lastly, and only if we finish on time, we'll do some personal sharing. So this is about our experiences that we've had. I went to the movies last night, saw this new show on TV, and anybody else watch that, that sort of thing, or you know, whose kid's having a birthday. Personal sharing from within the staff. Usually, most offices is the other way around. Everybody gets in their gabbing about what they did last night, what's happened to them this morning already, whose kid puked, blah, 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 whatever. And they rarely get around to talking about patients. Do it in the opposite direction. Have your morning meetings take some structure, and that structure has to be patients first, customer service first, and then personal news at the end of it. Let me reiterate, doctors, you're having a great day, every single day. One of the small offices that we purchased had metal frame doors, frames were metal, and on one of those metal frames walking into and out of the doctor's private office was this little magnet. It's a magnet stuck to the door frame and it's got all these different faces and it says, today I feel, and you're supposed to put it over how you feel. There's options on here, like mad, tired, confused, uh, bored. When I got there, do you know what it was on? It was on board. I took over a failing practice from a bored doctor. I guarantee you that if he didn't act bored, he wouldn't have a failing practice. But he did. He, he closed up shop, declared bankruptcy, and went to work for another dentist and I'm sure he was bored there too, but maybe some systems helped him. My point is, it has to be none of these other ones. If you walk in and you feel tired, I don't care. You put that sticker on happy. We got rid of the thing. I cut all the other faces out, and I left just the frame and the happy face. I left it up there until we finally sold that practice. You're not allowed to have any other emotion other than happy, excited, glad to be here. And that's who you need to show up every day, leave every day, and emulate that thought all throughout the entire day. That's how a morning meeting starts, happy. First impressions, remember that's what this whole global thing is about. So let's talk about the first appointment. Now I know there's a lot of dental practice speakers out there who talk about how the first appointment is gonna run. I will tell you, this is a conglomeration of the best. For years and years, I've been going to all the seminars that some of you have gone to as well. All the way back to, to uh, Kathy Jamerson and Linda Miles and you know all, all the, the big names about how to do the first appointment. What happens first, second, third, and all that. Let's go through that right now. Some of this might be review for some of you, but I guarantee you're gonna get some new stuff. And if you apply it, you'll find it is way better on the customer service front. It's what our patients are hoping to get. They just don't know how to ask. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. There's your first impression. Ha, sorry, dental humor. <laughs> first impression never dies. I've got one of these photos back in my album of uh, my high school years, and I'm sure other people do too. I know my wife had a chance to see it once. I didn't know her in high school, or even not until dental school. But uh, she still talks about that damn photo. It, that was like a first impression photo she saw at my mom and dad's house when she went through albums, photo albums. Like, oh my gosh, look at you. She still remembers. That impression stayed with her forever. 
those puffy shirts and oh my God. So how about these? What is your first impression with your, parent, with your patients? What's your appearance? How's your breath? Are you late or running on time? Do you have any bad manners? Do you have a bad attitude? Are any of those even thoughts in your patient's mind? They better not. If you came in and put your little square on the tired or grumpy guy, then maybe they're gonna see the, the bad attitude, the being laid off. You can't afford that. You've gotta make a great first impression. There's that sound. It happens once in a while. It's just to make sure you're awake, I guess. What happens first? I told you earlier that consult room is used on the, on the first video. That consult room is used as a living room. Come on in. Here's my patient, my hygienist, myself, and we're gonna sit and talk. What's my usual first question? Well, first I say, hello, I'm Tim Johnston. I never say doctor, they know. I'm Tim Johnston, and I just say, how can I help you? And I sit down in the chair, and I can see sometimes the tension just fall off their shoulders. They just relax. Often they say, oh, this is nice. We can just talk? I said, that's what I'm here for. Tell me. Admittedly, many, maybe even most of the time, it's simply, I'm here for a checkup and cleaning. Kind of it. So then I start looking for ways to connect. Oh, I see you moved. Where'd you move from? Oh, we moved from upstate New York. No kidding, I'm from upstate New York. It's where I grew up. Or I moved from the West Coast. Oh, I was born in California. Or my parents in the Navy. Oh, my dad was in the Navy. Whatever it may be, I'm looking for a connection so that all of a sudden we can become pals, friends, on the same level, on some level, on the same level, so that we are connected. The other times, maybe that 20% of the time, when it's not simply I'm here for cleaning and a checkup, they will tell me why they're there. And that's an important thing to listen to. Well, I went to this one dentist. He told me this. I didn't believe him. He had bad manners and bad breath. I went to another guy. He told me I needed 16 crowns, and I said, that's, that can't be. They were all healthy six months ago. They're going to have a story that is impactful on how you need to behave for the rest of your appointment. It gives me a clue into their psyche. If they're laying back in the chair the first time I meet them, and the hygienist says, I took a full-mouth series of x-rays. Here's John Doe. Have a look. I don't know anything about him. I've got to know something. One of the mentors in my life, I think it might have been Dawson or somebody said, never treat a stranger, which is great advice. Get to know him, even if it's just five minutes getting to know him. You'll know more about him in five minutes than you do in zero minutes. So never treat a perfect stranger. You want to get to know him a little bit. The consult room dialogue, did I hit all that? Let's see. Um, oh, let's talk about this. If the doctor is not available, let's say I'm in surgery and I cannot get out, I'm knuckle deep in blood, my hygienist will go in there and do it herself. Not a problem. I'm okay with that. I want to be there. Maybe 10% of the time I cannot be there because I'm too busy in the back. The hygienist will do it for me. She's heard me say it enough. She knows what to say. Always put a good spin on this appointment. I have to do this every single time because patients that have come from somewhere else are used to going to their dentist for 45 minutes to an hour tops to get their teeth clean. Our first appointment is going to be an hour and a half. So I say to them, Listen, I know that you're used to going to your dentist and things can just kind of run and you're, you're out of there in no time. I said, but keep in mind, this is our first visit with you, so I feel that we should get to know your mouth intimately. I want to know everything there is to know. I want to know where the fillings are, cavities, any kind of uh, abrasions or lesions, anything going on with your gums. We're looking at oral cancer, checking for periodontal disease. You know, I just repeated myself, looking at gums, periodontal. You can use all the words associated with it. It makes it a lot more in involved. It makes it sound like you're looking for more. But just say all the words you want to say there, but what you're looking at, and say, so that takes us a little bit longer. So your first appointment will be closer to an hour and a half. I just wanted to make sure you knew that. You know what they always say back to me? Thanks. Your front desk told me that when I made the appointment. And I know that they did, but I want them to hear it from me again. Now, they've heard it twice, so they know. Because before we started doing that, patients used to get upset. What has taken so long? Doc, I've been an hour and a half. I used to never have to go beyond 45 minutes of my old dentist. Well, the old dentist maybe wasn't doing a very thorough job. I never said that. But that's probably what it was. Once you start seeing us, an average adult appointment for a recare is gonna be an hour. You can get it done in less time if there's fewer teeth or a pretty clean mouth. But the idea is set the stage for the long appointment and set the stage for what's gonna happen later. The power of positive suggestion. I'm telling them all the benefits of being there. I'm not telling them what the problem is. Benefits, we're looking for this, looking for that. And if anything changes over time, we're gonna know how it changed because we're gonna have such accurate records of how you walked in today. I used to refer something about being able to identify the body from the dental records. My team finally told me that was too morbid, so I stopped that. <laughs> but it was fun for a while. Um, setting the stage, the one more thing to do. I'm not sure if it comes up in another slide. I, I've forgotten. So if you sit down with somebody who has got a really healthy mouth and nothing going on, then you, out, you check, you're out, all done. If you sit down with someone who's got just a a tank load of stuff going on, you know that you're not gonna to wanna to sit there and develop an entire treatment plan while you're doing your hygiene check for two minutes. So I, I say to people, I'll see you later on after 
who's in the room with us? Tammy. After Tammy finishes the hygiene part of your visit, I'll be in. And as long as everything looks pretty good, we should be in and out. If anything is looking like it's going to need some further discussion, if, if your case is a little bit more involved, try not to say things like complicated, because that makes it sound like maybe you're not going to be able to handle it. Involved is a good word. More involved. I may ask your permission to kind of take my notes and x-rays and, and photographs and just sit down tonight after work and work up treatment plans so I don't hold you up today. Again, selling benefits, so I don't hold you up today. Does that sound fair? Or something like that. I like using the word fair because everybody wants to be fair. Does that sound fair? Or does that sound okay? They're like, yeah, it's fine. I'll pull on that later in the appointment and pull it later in this, in this slide presentation as well. So consult room dialogue. Again, establish rapport. Where you from? What you been up to? Your kids are in college, where do they go? Establish that rapport. How can I help you? And then sit there. I want them to know that they're in the right place and that I'm glad they came in. That's a subcategory of how can I help you? How can I help you? Because we're using the word help. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to help you with whatever dental issues you have. Needs versus wants. You've gotta be really careful about what you call a need and a want. And I tell people this because they'll come in and say, yeah, I went to a new dentist last, you know, six months ago. He told me he had 16 crowns. I said, he say you needed them or they wanted to do them? Because those are two different things. And I tell people, I'm very particular about my use of vocabulary. I will tell you if you need something done, and that means it's either going to fall apart and cause you pain or embarrassment. If there's something in there that's gonna cause pain or embarrassment that I can fix ahead of time, then you need to have that done. If there's something that you would like me to do because it may improve your smile, then that's a want. And if you want to have some work done that falls outside the category of needs, I am happy to provide that service. Thrilled. I spend half of my day doing cosmetic work, honestly. But I will never tell you you need something if it's really more of an aesthetic want. You want a tooth straightened up, you want to be whiter, you want to get veneers. Those are all wants, none of those are needs. So I'm very careful about my vocabulary with that. Two more words I love to use. Let's say that the patient has already told you, oh, I've got a disaster going on, I've broken four teeth, blah, blah, blah. I just don't know how I'm gonna afford it. I, I've been avoiding the dentist because you know, I, I just have fear and, and I don't you know, it's, it's all this stuff. I like two words, schedule and budget. I say, listen, John, whatever it is we find, it's your mouth and I wanna make sure that we take care of you according to the needs of your schedule and your budget. It's your time, not mine, I'm here every day and it's your budget, not mine. Budget is an unoffensive word, you know that. If you say, I'm gonna do things as you can afford them, mm, no, nah, not so good. As you're able to pay for them, as you have enough money, all those things make it sound like you're condescending to somebody who doesn't have enough to take care of themselves. The word budget is kind of a neutral term. Everybody's got a budget. I've got a budget, you've got a budget, the government has a budget, they, they just don't adhere to it. But everybody has a budget. That's a non-offensive word. So the word schedule and budget come up frequently in my conversations with patients. If we get to a big treatment plan later, again, I'm gonna use the same vocabulary. We'll, we'll tackle this at a pace that's comfortable for your schedule and budget. Just rolls off my tongue. Uh, there we go, back to involved. If your needs are involved or complex, again, don't say complicated, don't say difficult, don't say beyond my expertise, outside my wheelhouse, I don't know what I'm gonna do. That's what they hear when you start saying some, some words like uh, complicated. Instead to say if it's involved or it's complex, well, we're gonna meet again next week right here in the same room after I've had a chance to look over your x-rays and develop a treatment plan. When is that gonna happen? Tonight after work. I always say that. I say, as I'll sit down tonight after work. Whether or not I'm going to, it doesn't matter. I want them to know that they are a priority to me. I'm gonna work on their stuff tonight after work. Now, if they actually take me up on that and schedule for tomorrow, I better actually finish my job tonight. Otherwise, I'll do it during lunch tomorrow or at a convenient time. Then they're gonna go in the back. First appointment still. A complete exam, and I do mean complete. My hygienists utilize a hygiene assistant when they're doing their charting so we can maintain clean environment, and everything is recorded, every single thing. You know what I'm talking about. Only the necessary x-rays, meaning a full mass series and a Panorex, or whatever you're able to provide for them. I know sometimes there's insurance limitations. People say, I only want the necessary x-rays. Got it, I'm gonna take all the ones I can because if I miss something, it's because I didn't take the one necessary to find that thing. Let's show patients what they have with interoral cameras. This is a huge bonus to dentistry. It's been around just since right after I started practicing. I maybe was in practice for two years when the first interoral cameras came out, all the analog stuff. I've never practiced a day without them since. You put this up on the screen. You know what patients are gonna ask first thing? Is that my tooth? Yes, it's your tooth, but it's surprising that that's what they say because who else's tooth would I put up on the screen? We just took a picture, I put it on the screen, and they go, is that my tooth? And they'll ask you if it's bad, is that bad? They'll see things. I have a really nice intraoral camera. I use that for uh, AACD cases, for taking pictures for the website, things like that where I really wanna show detail. But most of our stuff is done with those 
I uh, don't have it up. It's done with those simple interall cameras on the wall. That's a few hundred dollars. I know they sell $6,000 ones, but you can get that from a company on the internet, on Amazon, uh, called, um, I'll think of it later. I'll make sure it's included with whatever you're watching this on. Anyway, they, um, it's bothering me, I can't think of it. A few hundred dollars, and you can get all the great pictures you need. Close-ups like that, they came off of that camera. Take some pictures, intraoral, extraoral, et cetera, so you've got a record of how they started. That can become important legally, or it can just become important for your own diagnostics. You're gonna sit down after work and start working up a case. I'd like to have a, a picture. It'll jog my memory. Oh yeah, that's what I saw in that mouth. We're gonna use a diagnodent for those really small crevices, and we're gonna make sure that we record those. In my office, 20 to 30 is the gray zone. We're thinking about it. Below 20, you're healthy. Above 30, you're getting a filling. 20 to 30, we're gonna write that number down and monitor that over the next few sessions. If it starts to grow and gets above 30, we're gonna put a filling in then. If you're not using a diagnodent in your office, they were really popular 15, 20 years ago, and we've used them ever since. I know a lot of people have never heard of it. They still sell them. They're amazing little laser tools that look inside the crevices of the teeth, give a little laser feedback, and it tells you what's under the surface, decay or not. This is an example of a hygienist going, I got a little stick in there, and the diagnodent read 100. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. The, the diagnodent only is looking at the really small things. If you can already get a stick with an explorer, it's gonna be off the scale for a diagnodent. So you're looking at these subclinical lesions, subclinical, you're not detecting them yet, maybe there's a little stain, oh, is that a cavity? Put the diagnodent on that. Just for giggles, when my patient said I got, or my hygienist said I got a little stick there, we clearly just taken out a tooth too. I opened it up, now remember that's a virgin tooth. So when you first look at that, you're thinking, oh, I'm seeing old dical. Nope, that is still fresh decay, just going through the enamel dentin layer. Once the tooth was cleaned out, it looked like that. Now that's a pretty good size hole from my hygienist saying, I think there's a little stick there, and the diagnet was 100. Oh, no kidding. So figure them all out, get them restored. That's, of course, composite resin. I haven't done amalgams in 24 uh, years, going on 25 years now. Um, and then perio classification is gonna determine the rest of your appointment. If they're class one or two versus class three classes versus class four, that's gonna drive the rest of this first appointment in a different direction. Let's talk about it. Oh yeah, this is nice. Your gums look sensitive. Let me stab them with this prison shank. That's what patients think when you get out the perio probe. So please be gentle. You don't need to sound to bone. You don't need to make everything bleed that could bleed. Gentle, please. Hygienist, dentist, both. Gentle perio probing. Don't make them think you got a prison shank in their mouth. All right, so phase one. If you are, if your patient is healthy or has a little mild gingivitis, you're gonna go through these steps. A light scale, a prophy, a fluoride, and a little general education, dental education, how to take better care of your mouth, flossing instructions, something like that. Appointment done, easy enough. Are you offering fluoride, by the way? Fluoride, you say I said that, it's an important part. Are you offering fluoride to all of your adult patients, especially, all your patients, especially the adults? Because you should be, right? We know as dentists that the cavity prone years are no longer teenage years or what was that, the old one was like eight to 15, that was the big cavity prone years. Now it's 65 and above. Dry mouth is the biggest problem. Our seniors are on all these meds, especially heart med. If you're on a heart med, you've got to reduce salivary capacity. It's just how it works. Anybody taking anything or just old age is drying up salivary glands, they are so much more at risk for, gut, for both gum disease and cavities, but especially cavities, that you've got to do something to combat it. I tell my patients, listen, you're getting older, your saliva is slowing down, they go, oh, I know, I have dry mouth all the time. Like, did you know that's the number one way to get fresh cavities is by having a dry mouth? The number one way to combat that is with fluoride application. So you should be sure, you know, of course you're using a fluoride toothpaste, I hope, and there's a few that aren't. Some of those natural products don't have it in there. So you're using a fluoride toothpaste, make sure you're using fluoride mouth rinse, and when you do those, you're using a concentration of either 500 parts per million for toothpaste or 1,250 parts per million for mouthwash. What we give you has a concentration of 20,000 parts per million of fluoride, and that gets into the pores of your teeth and strengthens it. It's fantastic. Don't tell me it's your drinking water has fluoride. That's one part per million. That's not gonna do the trick for you. That's for when you're growing teeth as a baby. You need topical application of fluoride. So how many of our adult patients get fluoride? As many as we can convince they should have it, which in my practice is probably about 90%, 85, 90%. I think I've got some stats on that coming up. What about, oh, here we go, strength of fluoride. Tap water, zero to four parts per million. Ideal is 1.0. I happen to be very fortunate to live in a community that is already naturally fluoridated at about 0.7 to 0.9, depending on which, uh, which aquifer or which well they're, they're bringing it up out of. 
Um, so we don't see a lot of, of um, early carries in, in my community, Williamsburg, Virginia. What about bottled water? I looked at a study once, they had 17 different bottles of bottled water, ranging from zero to two parts per million, depends on where it comes from and whether or not they filter out for it. Toothpaste has 1,500 parts per million. I misspoke earlier when I said five. Uh, mouthwash is the low one, 226. Fluoride gel, that's uh, like uh, Floridex, for example, 5,000 parts per million. And then in-office fluoride, 22,600 parts per million is the fluoride that you put on your patient's mouth, whether it's the varnish or the foam. Hopefully you're not using foam trays anymore. Everybody should be on varnish by now. It sticks around much longer, is much better. You know, we're the only profession I know actively working to put ourselves out of business. If everybody did everything we suggested every day, we wouldn't have nearly the needs that we have today. Everybody ought to be having that when they come in. Are we really giving fluoride to everyone? Well, do they have a good reason to accept? Yeah, they should if we've talked to them as adult to adult and said, here's what you need to have done. For my practice, I went ahead and when I gave this presentation to just my staff, I quoted some statistics. So here we are a couple of years ago, over just July and August in my practice, we saw 5,226 adult profies. We did 952 child profies, and we delivered 3,504 fluoride treatments, or 57%. Why was that? Because at that time, my own staff had not seen this presentation either. We are now up to like 85, 90%. You can do it. Look at what a difference it made just in my own practice. They knew, but they'd never been convinced that they needed to tell their adult patients to have fluoride. If people, uh, this is what I told my staff, if people know what we know, the number would be 99%. Well, now they know what we know, and we're getting closer to that number all the time. So tell them. Tell your patients, here's what fluoride does for you. You should be getting it as an adult. Most insurances are even covering it for adults now as well. They did for a long time. So let's say that new patient is a class two diagnosis for perio. They've got some inflammation. You're gonna do a gross debridement today and then bring them back for a fine tune up on the scaling. That means today you're gonna to spend a little more time on education. You're gonna spend a little bit more time on gross debridement. You're probably not gonna floor out them yet because you haven't fully gotten them cleaned up and you're just gonna polish them off. That should take about the same amount of time as the other. What if you've got someone in the class three or class four perio or, and or, they are restoratively just bombed out? Again, you're gonna spend a little more time on education. Your dentist probably wants you to get some study models, especially if it's restoratively bombed out. That's gonna take some time. You wanna take a little bit more photos. I want some full mouth shots as well as the intraoral, like every single tooth on the intraoral, and a little more education at the end. Education at the beginning as to what you're doing, education at the end as to why you're doing it, right? And then how do we stay on schedule? All these different mouths come to the door. How is it that I can schedule 90 minutes for every single new patient and we get everything we need to get done, done? Because I have a dentist some of the time. I, I need two hours because maybe it'll be clean in mouth, maybe it'll be a disaster. How do I know? You don't. But give yourself an hour and a half, and here's how it'll work. We set the stage right here. Again, I told you, if a patient has already told me, oh, my mouth's a mess, it's a disaster, I got four broken teeth, whatever, tell them, we'll take a good look at everything. And listen, if it is that involved, let me, do me the favor, let me just take all the records we take today and my notes and my thoughts. I'll sit down tonight after work and go through it and drop a treatment plan. And if there's any alternative treatment plans, I'll, I'll come up with those as well. So you have choices if, if it's appropriate. That sound okay? Does that sound fair? And they say, yeah, fine. So now I'm gonna pull back that conversation and say, well, sure enough, John, your mouth's kind of a train wreck, just like you said. Listen, I'm not gonna sit here and try to come up with a treatment plan just off the cuff. That wouldn't be fair to either of us. So let me sit down tonight with your records. Can you come back in later, you know, this week or next week? And we'll just sit up there in the consult room again, my living room, and we'll get a cup of coffee, and we'll talk about your treatment. Does that sound all right? Oh, sure, doc, that sounds fine. So that's how you get out of a complicated, involved treatment plan. You don't try to develop a treatment plan while you're sitting in there for your two-minute hygiene check, and then it's taking 20 minutes and put the rest of the day behind. All right, flexibility is the key. You've just got to stay flexible. My favorite childhood character of all time, Gumby. The, he's the most flexible guy out there. You need to become a Gumby when it comes to how you interact with your patients on that first appointment. Flexibility is the key. Does the doctor or the hygienist do the first visit? This comes up all the time, right? Should, should they be seen in hygiene first or should they be seen in doctors first? Well, let's be frank. I cannot make nearly as much with my hands in a hygiene visit as I can doing a crown or an implant or you know, a bunch of fillings, whatever. I am more productive doing dentistry. I'm less productive doing hygiene. Converse of that, the argument is, oh, they need to make a connection with you. You want to be there for the first appointment to make sure you see everything and you're connected with them. I connect with them in the console room, and then I don't have to spend my valuable hand time doing perio probings and photographs, stuff that I can easily delegate away to a hygienist. And frankly, she's way better at cleaning teeth than I will ever be, because what do we get in dental school? One course in, in scaling for you know three hours a week, 
they got two years of it. I, I'm not gonna pretend that I can clean teeth any better than a hygienist. So all the hygiene services belong in hygiene. But the real answer is both, right? We're both gonna take part in that first appointment. I'm gonna help out with that first interview, then I'm gonna delegate everything else to the hygienist, I'm gonna come back in and do a wrap up at the end and present treatment options, or let them know we're gonna postpone those treatment options until we have a better feel for it. So we're both doing it, but my time is very minimal. Five minutes in the beginning, two minutes at the end, seven minutes more or less in a first appointment. And those first people, first appointment people, still think I'm awesome, mostly because of that first five minutes. I took the time to listen to their needs. Again, far more important. The doctor can I be far more uh, productive with a drill in my hands. And that's the name of the game. It's a numbers game at the end of the day. You've gotta make enough money to stay open. So I need to be fully engaged in doing dentistry as much as I can. The hygienist will take time. What woman out there, this is not meant to be sexist, but what woman out there is not better at me at making personal connections? All of them are, I can tell you that right now. I might be personable on a scale, I might be a, a wonderful speaker and whatnot, but I don't know a lady out there who's not better than me at making a personal connection with all of our patients. They just are, they're more intuitive, more feeling. I have a question for hygienists. I love when there's a live audience, but we'll just pretend for today. What's your primary function in a dental office? When I give this to a new audience, most of the hands go up and say, cleaning teeth, hygiene services, you know, somewhere along the lines of what they do. I will tell you that is not it at all. Your primary role is building relationships. It is to build that foundational relationship so that patient never wants to go anywhere else but our dental practice. They want you to be their hygienist forever. I have 10 hygienists, but I'm telling you, the patients only see the one they saw the first time. Unless something happens, somebody's out sick or whatever. They want their hygienist. They have a personal connection to that person. I have, high, I have dental associates that have come and gone through the years. Very little turnover, but it happens. The patients stay with us because they stay with their hygienist. What dentist come in and does the check or does an occasional filling is almost inconsequential. Different story if it's a rehab, they work in everything, but for the occasional stuff, patients just don't even care. They want their hygienist because you've built that relationship. That's goal one. Job one is to build relationships in your dental practice. What's your secondary function? Now we can go to hygiene services, and eh, still not there. Secondary function is to identify treatment needs. I don't mean you're diagnosing. I know in every state in the country you're not allowed to diagnose, but you can identify treatment needs. I will come in and diagnose and put it on paper. You can identify it. You can help the patient warm up to the idea that a broken cusp on number 30 is gonna mean a crown. Because every single time you've got a broken cusp on a molar, it's gonna get a crown, as long as you and your doctor agree on that. In my office it is. So I refer to that as the hygiene cauldron. When they're in hygiene, the gold keeps bubbling up to the top because you guys, you ladies, the hygienists, need to be identifying treatment needs. So it's written down, so when I come in, I'm not starting with a blank sheet of paper having to look with as much detail and focus as you give the teeth while you're cleaning them. You'll spend a couple of minutes on every single tooth, you're gonna find everything that's in there. I'm gonna spend a couple of seconds on every single tooth, and I know that I'm gonna miss a few things if you haven't already sort of warmed up the, the table, if you haven't already made me some notes on the things that you identified, the hygiene calder. So then what's third? Debatable. I'm gonna tell you, it's, I think hygiene services are probably there, but it may be leadership services. Because if you're a hygienist in either a small practice or large, it doesn't matter, there are some people looking up to you. Maybe a hygiene assistant, maybe someone from the front desk doesn't have as much experience with teeth as you do. Hygienist, you're the second most educated person in the office, at least dentally speaking, the dentist and then you and everybody else. You have a position of leadership that I could say might be third on your list of important jobs and then hygiene services at the end. But whatever, it, cleaning teeth falls down on my scale. I know it's important, but it's not the most important thing hygienists do. Fourth function, take care of stuff. You know, help at the lab, get the front desk cleaned up, go through your, your room, sharpen tools, whatever. That ancillary duties. So here's a question. Do we give patients a checkup and cleaning on their first appointment? And are you offended by that? Because there's so much talk and turbulence about, oh, we don't just clean teeth. It's not a checkup. It's a comprehensive oral evaluation. And we're providing periodontal services, whether it's, you know, type one or type four. We're not just cleaning teeth. I get it. But have you ever had a patient call and ask this? How much is the cleaning? Yeah, they do, because they don't know what else to ask. They don't know the term periodontal prophylaxis. They don't know the term oral hygiene instructions. They don't know the terms that you want us in the profession to use to describe your treatment, because it's a checkup and cleaning. Let's face it, that's what everybody knows. Or the other question they ask, how much is the crown? Why, because they went to their dentist, and he said, you need a crown, and it's gonna be $1,200, and that's sticker shock. 
and they got to call around, how much is the crown? What do they mean to say on each of these? Are you taking new patients? Are you taking new patients? That's what they're calling to ask. They picked up the phone and called the office. So don't be offended by someone who says, how much is the cleaning? Or be offended when I say, you need a checkup and a cleaning, and that's what they're here for. It's the vernacular of the populace. Don't try to convert the entire United States of America's population to use your terminology. Why don't you just join the bandwagon and use the terminology they're already using so that we can communicate appropriately. Again, why do they ask these questions? What are they expecting? What are you expecting them to ask? They're gonna ask the vernacular they know. Have you ever had somebody call the office and ask this? Hello, I'd like to schedule a comprehensive exam, full mouth series of x-rays, and mounted diagnostic casts, and then perhaps a consultation with the dentist to discuss having a professional oral prophylaxis and fluoride treatment. That's what we would love for them to call and say, right? Never gonna happen. It has never happened in the history of dentistry. It will never happen in the future of dentistry. And yet that's what a lot of dental lecturers say you should be striving toward educating your patients to the point where they have that value of your services. I disagree. Your first appointment, sorry to say it, it's a checkup and cleaning, even if they don't get clean because they have gum disease. All right, how do we manage our time if we don't know what kind of mouth is walking in the door? This goes back to what I was talking about earlier. It's gonna work out based on what we're doing. And I like this, let's allow 80, 90 minutes now since we've introduced oral cancer screenings and more photos and all that. We used to allow 80, I'm doing 90 now. That's my uh, Qu uh, Jose Cuervo guy or whatever it was, the Dos Equis guy, right? I don't always brush my teeth, rinse with mouthwash, floss, and brush again. But when I do, it's 25 minutes before my dentist appointment. It's so true, right? You have twice a year flossers in your practice. They floss right before they come to see you and think that they're gonna fool you. Oh, do you floss? Yes. When? Oh, half an hour ago. Last night, you know, last two days, whatever. I had a guy one time said, I floss for a week before I come. So I'll fool you. I'm like, you're not fooling me. I'm just letting you do what you wanna do. It's, it's your mouth, pig pen. So, 80 minutes. If it's a healthy mouth, the first five minutes is gonna be meet and greet with me. Then minutes six through 40 is gonna be data collection, x-rays, charting, periodontal exam. Minutes 41 through 45 are gonna be summarize and educate. Then you're gonna clean from 46 to 80, give them their fluoride. And then I, the last 10 minutes really is my time. I come in and spend my two, three minutes doing my exam. 90 minutes, check clean, and they're out. What if it's type two? Again, one through five minutes, meet and greet. We're gonna spend about the same amount of time collecting data, because on a mild periodontal case, it doesn't take any more time to collect. You're still gonna probe all six points on every single tooth. 41 to 50, summarize and educate. We're spending a little bit more time here, 10 minutes instead of five, summarizing and educating so that they understand what periodontal disease is. Then we're gonna prov provide a gross debridement, because you're gonna bring it back for a polishing, a gross debridement, and then 10 more minutes at the end of that for the doctor to come in and summarize. Periotype three and four, again, five minutes to meet and greet. This is where you're gonna find out this person has a lot of needs. Six through 50, 10 minutes extra to collect data because there's gonna be a few more pictures involved. You probably have a little bit longer, harder time doing a perio probing because the points are gonna bleed on you. You gotta clean things off once in a while. So a few minutes extra for that. Education, you're gonna spend an awful lot of time educating on gum disease and what you're gonna be doing, talking about what quad scale and root plane is in English terms. They might wanna call it a deep cleaning, Fine, let them, who cares? We'll call it quadrant scaling root planning because that's what's on the insurance forms. It's one on our, on our walkout statements. But you're gonna spend most of the time doing that. And then the last 10 minutes, you might get diagnostic models for your doctor and then he comes in and does your work. Either way, no matter what happens here, we end at 80 minutes. So it doesn't matter what kind of patient walks in your door. You can finish the whole thing on your end, 80 minutes, give the doctor an extra 10, five to wait for him to come in, and you know two, three to follow up on it. And then you can clean your room and you're done and ready for the next patient after 90 minutes. That's how a first appointment ought to work. That's the end of module two. I hope you've enjoyed that, and I look forward to questions.